So as we've heard before, traditionally uh, kidney cancer management was very simple, basically take it out, take out the whole kidney. What's changed is pa patients getting scans for absolutely no clinical indication whatsoever. You even get people saying, uh, it's very good, Philip, you had your scan done and, uh, and I feel much better that you, you're at 90, you don't have a kidney tumor. Um, but uh, there are some, some downsides, I suppose, of having this. And, and it all creates a bit of trouble for those of us looking after these patients. Uh, because our typical patients uh, aren't uh, particularly young, fit, and healthy, uh, or, or thin. So, and, and the highest incidence is in elderly patients. So you're going to have, if you treat kidney cancer and you get patients sent to you, the people who get imaging done are people who are not well. Those people are not well for a variety of reasons, but oftentimes because they're sick, they're old and infirm, and then you're faced with a patient with a kidney tumor, they're elderly, and you're wondering what, what to do with them. And active surveillance we've heard about, uh, image guided we've heard about. Um, these are the, uh, the, the management options I would put before you, which you've heard about already. Uh, but I've got a problem with the elderly, because uh, compared to patients who are younger, it's been shown uh, in a recent paper that, that elderly patients are more likely to have uh, malignant tumors as opposed to benign tumors. And you guess it, they're going to be more, more likely to be advanced in stage as well. So these are not necessarily all benign tumors in elderly patients. So you have to take them seriously. And if you observe them, you will find that some of them or a significant proportion will progress and you're going to have to treat them at some stage. So they're not getting any younger. Should we intervene earlier or should we wait until they grow? An open partial nephrectomy, we all know, associated with an open, uh, open wound that can be quite painful. And patients really, uh, obviously, are looking for an alternative to this. So can we do it with keyhole surgery? Um, the issues with partial nephrectomy have been hit upon by uh, Dr. Dr. Cavusi eloquently uh, with warm ischemia and the complications. And warm ischemia, this is, uh, it's not a very old paper from Indy Guild, 2006, but it's out of date already because warm ischemia times are now about half of what they were before with early declamping. But the longer the warm ischemia time does predict uh, 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 glomerular filtration rate loss. Complications, this is a, a paper from Lou Cavusi's uh, institution uh, looking at what, what patients are likely to run into complications with laparoscopic partial nephrectomy. A whole host of them, in fact, are associated with higher complication rates and independently ASA grade and smoker um, are, and now the conclusion you come from this is that we ought to do laparoscopic partial nephrectomy in young, healthy patients. And the problem is these patients don't come to my clinic very often with their small renal masses. So in the future we'll be using a scalpel, perhaps not, perhaps we'll be using a, a variety of needle techniques or perhaps a, a HIFU or, or a perhaps freezing. The question is, is it better to heat a kidney tumor uh, or perhaps to freeze it? And uh, I'm here to argue for freezing. Um, there are a couple of requirements you have for needle ablation. First of all, you need to make sure you can deliver it safely and it doesn't cause damage to the collecting system or, dare I quote you, David, the duodenum or anything else around the kidney. Um, you have to be able to target the energy accurately onto the lesion that you're trying to treat. You then must trust that this energy is going to kill off the tumor cells. You could, if you warm them up or freeze them down, but some of them survive, then you haven't done the job effectively. So you have to choose the right energy that's going to produce a, a, a cell kill. And finally, you have to be able to distinguish between success and failure in your follow-up imaging. So in order to avoid collateral damage, you do tend to select patients based on tumor lo localization. And I'd argue, uh, we, you, David's shown you how you can push the colon out of the way and what have you, but we tend to offer uh, image guided for patients who have uh, tumors that are located in a more, uh, 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 in a safer location. And not a, a tumor that's located, for instance, where this pink uh, circle is uh, near the PUJ or, or ureter. Um, and also, it has to be delivered so that you don't get a skip lesion, you don't get the collateral damage uh, from energy that is not devoted exactly where you want it to be. In terms of RFA, you've already heard this, but uh, effectively, a single needle is placed, and you can then shape, you've got a single shape of a lesion. The shape might be a uh, different size depending on the uh, device used, but, and you can get some feedback based on impedance and temperature, but you really can't look at the 
uh, lesion you're creating with any form of imaging. And the original cryo probes also involved putting a single needle into the middle of a tumor and kind of trying to choose the right tumor so that this one needle could cover it uh, with the right amount of energy. So you can see the two tumors, and, and it's a good thing that both, they're both small because they're, if it was bigger, you couldn't possibly cover it with, with that needle. Now with cryo, in these days, with 17 gauge needles, you can use multi-needle configurations and shape the ice to fit the shape of the tumor instead of uh, choosing the tumor to fit the shape of the ice. And you can monitor this ablation with a, a variety of things. You can follow the temperature using the uh, uh, thermocouples, uh, follow it with ultrasound, laparoscopic ultrasound. You can also just see where the edge of the ice is, make sure it's well beyond the edge of the tumor. Uh, does it induce a reliable cell kill? Uh, essentially, if you can get below minus 40 in the entire tumor, then I think you can trust that it's going to, to die off. If, however, you get to be beneath, uh, below minus 20 but below, above minus 40, then if you uh, do a, a second freeze cycle, uh, it will get, induce this, a complete cell kill. So we do uh, two separate freeze thaw cycles. How does it work? Effectively, the first time through, uh, the extracellular uh, water is frozen preferentially and allows the cells to survive uh, a, 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 a very low temperature because of osmosis. But the second one, by raising it just above the level of freezing, uh, we can often get more times uh, get the intracellular ice crystals to disrupt the cells. Finally, you have to be able to, to trust in your follow-up imaging to tell you whether it worked or not. So you can see, as uh, David shown you, that lesions tend to swell in the immediate post-operative period and then gradually turn into a scar. You can look for contrast enhancement. And uh, there is a difference between laparoscopic and, uh, uh, sorry, between cryoablation and radiofrequency um, and a, a number of differences. But one of them is, was uh, uh, demonstrated by this study from the Cleveland Clinic, which showed the patients who had had uh, biopsies done, radiographically, the RFA did fairly well but pathologically it did much worse. So there are just some questions about whether uh, radiofrequency gets the complete cell kill uh, that cryo does. Well, and in addition, all the positive biopsies in the cryo group had uh, abnormal CT scans, while in the uh, post-radiofrequency ones, uh, you couldn't necessarily trust that the CT scan correlated with the biopsies. David has already pointed out this is not necessarily the, the whole answer. And I'm not sure if, uh, if we're going to get to the final answer anytime soon. But it's fair to say that it's easier to determine success after cryo than it is after radiofrequency. This uh, meta-analysis also shows that the radiofrequency patients required more repeat ablations, had more local recurrence, and had more, uh, not very high numbers, but uh, still more progression to metastatic disease. Here's a more difficult paper. I'm showing you retrospective studies. Patients were selected for lots of different reasons, and it might be that these are entirely different populations and shouldn't be compared to one another. But in any case, uh, they were compared, so I'll show you the data. Um, laparoscopic cryoablation here versus partial nephrectomy. Complication rates were, were significantly higher in the partial nephrectomy rate which, uh, group, which wouldn't surprise you. After quite a bit more follow-up in the cryo group, There's, there were more recurrences in the cryo group. So there is a bit of a trade-off there. Uh, but I do think we have to interpret these, these, this, these data with, with great caution. Fortunately, in this country, we've got uh, funding for a feasibility study, at least for a, a study comparing needle ablation to extirpative surgery. We'll have to report back in a few years' time to see whether we were able to recruit and whether we're able to get the, the answers that we're looking for. Uh, but hopefully, we'll get somewhere based on that. So the rationale for cryoblation is that the, the incidence of smaller tumors is rising. Prognosis is generally good, so you want to treat, uh, choose a treatment with less morbidity. Um, we can monitor the uh, treatment in real time, and we have to trade off the effectiveness of the treatment versus the morbidity induced. Try to get the balance, and, but I would say get it right the first time. I don't want to have to go back and treat a, a tumor again after, the, after having put them through once. Thank you very much.